Okay, I'm going to do um, a voiceover on this PowerPoint um, on assessment tools um, and research. And basically what I want you guys to get out of this is um, to kind of relate some of that statistical analysis of assessment tools um, and to become familiar with some of the terminology that's associated with them. So um, when you look in your assessment tools um, in, the, um, in the manual, um, you're going to see all these statistical terms. And what I really want you to get is to be able to um, relate to what, what that means um, and, and to interpret it and to analyze it um, and to pick out what's important um, in order for you to see if this is a, a good test, okay? If this is um, something worth your time, okay? I also want you to identify... Um, threats to validity and reliability um, of testing. Um, so when you give an assessment, what's going to stand in your way of, of reliability and validity? Um, in other words, um, how valid are your results and how reliable are your results? Um, and we'll talk about that. And then to describe ethical considerations for your testing as well. Um, so what's ethical? Um, the purpose of assessments is to obtain accurate information about the subject in a given situation. Okay, so again, um, the purpose of giving an assessment is to obtain accurate information about the subject in a given situation. Um, so when we're doing an evaluation for early intervention, we're usually in their home setting or in a natural environment, right? Um, and we're trying to see how that child is functioning at that given time in that given situation. Um, same thing with outpatient therapy, okay? Um, you're working one-on-one, -on -one, you're in a new environment, you're there with somebody that they may not have, have ever met before. If it's an initial evaluation, um, they may not have ever met you before. Um, so they're gonna have to, to work with somebody that they're not familiar with, okay? But again, and sometimes parents had a really hard time with this, but again, um, we're looking at obtaining how that child performs in that given situation. And so in that given situation, we can look and generalize um, to how that child performs in a new environment with a new person. Um, so again, I, I just, I feel like even though some parents would sometimes say, well, they don't know you or, um, you know, this is not a room they're familiar with. I would often tell them that, well, they're going to be placed um, in rooms that they're not familiar with, and they're going to have to work with teachers and other students that they're not quite familiar with, too. So this helps us um, to determine how um, they perform in this type of situation. Um, also, at school, okay, when we look at information um, about how the, how the subject or, or patient um, performs within that school system as well at that given time. Um, the results of assessment tools, um, we can decide if further assessment is necessary. So um, looking at the Peabody, um, <clears throat> it looks at you know fine motor skills, it looks at visual motor skills, which is kind of like um, hand-eye coordination. Um, so we can <clears throat> identify um, if we do just one section of that and they score really, really good in, or if we do all sections of it, they score really, really good in gross motor and they score poorly in fine motor and poorly in, in visual motor, um, we can elaborate then on, on some other assessments. So if they score poor on fine motor, visual motor, well, I wonder how their handwriting is or I wonder how their self-care skills are. Okay, or maybe they score really, really good with fine motor, visual motor, and they score poorly on gross motor. And so maybe some of the things on the on the gross motor portion of the assessment um, look at ambulation and gait patterns. And so I may um, request that a physical therapist looks at um, looks and assesses this child as well, and and because of um, their response to gait, their gait patterns. Um, assessments can also help aid in the diagnostic process. Um, so particularly looking at, I think there's the, the CARS, which is an aut autism rating scale. Um, you know, if the child performs a certain, certain level or a certain score, there's a chance that they may have um, autism, that sort of thing. You'd work 
collaboratively with um, your physician on this, of course. Um, but it would it would help us in, in diagnosing um, a certain diagnosis um, depending on how they performed with um, their specific behaviors. It also may help predict future performance in measured areas. So if we're looking at autism, maybe that would help predict how they score in maybe some social function areas um, or socialization or um, communication. Um, results of assessments are also used to determine eligibility for services. Um, so um, in some areas, I know that um, when you're looking at an assessment tool, they need to have a 50% delay in one area or one domain or a 25% delay in two domains. Okay, so that would mean 25% delay in visual motor and fine motor, okay, um, in order for them to qualify for um, therapy services. Um, I have a friend who works in Arkansas, and there, um, their eligibility for services, they require a Z-score of negative two, um, which we'll talk about later. Um, in some places, they require a standard deviation of negative 1.5. Um, so every place is a little bit different on, on that eligibility for services, um, and it depends on what setting you work in also, whether it's early intervention or school systems or outpatient. Um, I can tell you in North Dakota outpatient where I worked, um, they didn't necessarily focus on Z-scores or standard deviations. I mean, I would report all those scores, and they would definitely want to see some sort of a delay um, in those scores, but it was my job to link those low scores to something functional. So I would say, you know, patient showing delay in fine motor visual motor skills. Um, as, you know, the Peabody score was dot, dot, dot. Um, Specifically, they are having trouble um, manipulating utensils. They are having trouble um, getting dressed and doing dressing fasteners. And most six-year-old kids are able to do this based on this assessment. Um, so again, I would, I would give the assessment tool and spell out the delay, but I would link it to some functional things that they were having trouble with, and I would state what typically they would be able to do. Um, and I, I didn't have trouble getting eligibility um, for for kids when there was those functional functional delays, and I had the the assessment tools to back it up. Um, they also help us develop intervention plans. So based on our assessment tool um, that we give, um, it's going to help us <clears throat> come up with goals. So if we see a child really struggling with fine motor visual motor parts of an assessment, I would hope that our intervention plan or our goals would have something to do um, and functionally have something to do with fine motor visual motor skills, okay? Um, assessments are really good at evaluating progress in therapy. Um, we can compare um, six months out, so if you remember we have um, our recertification is in 90 days and we have to update every six months for the um, for the insurance for reauthorizations, right? And so we can give and we can bill a reevaluation one time a year and an, an evaluate and an evaluation one time a year. So that means we can bill an evaluation and then six months later we can bill a reevaluation, um, do a reevaluation of the same assessment tool, and we can compare that assessment to the initial assessment, and we can measure progress that way. So we can say. Initially, the child um, had a raw score of 25, which put them in the 25th percentile um, for children their age compared to the mean or compared to the normative data of the assessment tool. However, um, now they're scoring a, a raw score of 30 with a percentile rank of um, 30%, therefore they're making progress. However, um, they're still struggling in these areas. And then you can update your goals on the, the future or the, the current um, areas that they're having problems with. Um, so it's a good way to measure progress. It's a good way to identify um, new goals 
to update that new plan of care. So I highly recommend using assessments for that as well. You can also use assessments for research. So right now, uh, my research group, <clears throat> we are doing the sensory profile caregiver questionnaire, um, and we are giving it to um, a typical population, and we're also giving it to a population of, of um, caregivers who care for children who've experienced trauma. And so then our job is going to be in comparing um, the two different sensory profiles from the two different populations to see is there a difference in sensory processing um, among children who've experienced trauma and to those who haven't. So again, you can use those assessments as kind of pre-post assessments um, to measure progress, um, to determine if an intervention is working or not, um, or to compare two different populations um, as areas of research. How we collect data, and, and when we, we're saying data collection, it's how we're getting information from our clients, okay? Um, we're getting health history. Um, we're trying to find out some general history about the child, an occupational profile, right? What is the child like? Okay, how would we get that information from them? Um, we can get that by interviewing. We can get that by doing questionnaires. Um, I came up with a, a simple little questionnaire um, a health history questionnaire for parents. My child's experience developmental milestones, um, you know, 12 months, six months, one month, you know, and I'd have them, um, it was just sort of a checklist of, of um, where their children were at. So I kind of got a history if there was a um, any history of developmental delay or um, a significant birth history or a diagnosis or accident or something like that. Um, you can also do different surveys um, with parents, um, asking them to, to fill out certain things, certain questionnaires. Um, experimental data collection is just um, when you give an assessment tool and you record the results. And so I think of just your typical, um, you're giving the Peabody developmental motor scales, you give the child um, some specific instructions, um, and you score it. You document it and you give them a score. Um, you also do um, data collection by observing. Maybe you're observing a child at mealtime. Maybe you're observing a child at recess. Okay, and you're just kind of seeing how they interact with their environment, how they interact with other people. What stands out to you? Um, if you're observing at mealtime, does the child um, gag with certain textures? Do they um, not want to touch their food or do they have food all over the place and they don't even realize it. Okay, those would be some important observations to make note of. Um, again, you would, <clears throat> it's very common to have some questionnaires or interviews as ways to get information. Um, you can also do different measurements. Maybe you do range of motion. Okay, maybe you do grip strength, pinch strength. Um, maybe you measure edema. Um, maybe you measure limb growth or, or limb length or something like that. Um, ecological um, ways of data collection have to do with um, <clears throat> have to do with recording physical, social, and psychological features of a child's development. Okay, so again, ecological, you're recording physical, social, and psychological features of a child's development. You're recording physical, social, and psychological features of a child's development. A naturalistic ecological data collection, you're looking at specifically the environmental contexts. So in a naturalistic ecological data collection, you're looking at the child's environmental contexts, okay? You're looking at the child or you're considering how the child's at home, how they're at daycare, how they're at school, um, how they're at Walmart, okay? You're just being very natural um, in how you're seeing how they interact with their environment. When we talk about arena, I think of um, early intervention where 
you have different specialties, different specialists, like an OT, maybe we're looking at fine motor skills. A PT, maybe they're looking at gross motor skills. A speech therapist, maybe they're looking at communication. Okay, you're all still looking at that child's development, okay, physical, social, psychological development of a child, um, but you're looking at that you're looking at that in that home situation, okay? Because early intervention is, is within that home situation. Um, so you're looking at, at that natural environment, still um, looking at their overall development, but it's more of an arena because you have multiple disciplines looking at specific contexts at the same time. So PT, again, is looking at gross motor, OTs at, at fine motor, speech at communication, uh, maybe a teacher's in there looking at at um, comprehension and cognition. Um, so just some of those different things. Um, again, you're looking at that normal development of all those different areas. But again, you have the different disciplines that are different. Where naturalistic is more uh, considering how that child's performing in each of their um, environments. <clears throat> Types of measurement tests that we have that we're going to be going over um, are norm reference tests, criterion reference tests, and informal assessments. Um, so Kay Smith on page 226 has a great comparison chart between norm reference and criterion referenced assessments. Um, and page 155 in Mulligan um, is going to be an excellent, excellent reference for you when you're preparing your um, assessment tool critique because um, it tells you there's many, many, many assessments that we have and that you're going to be presenting on, and it tells you if it's criterion or if it's norm referenced or if it's an informal assessment, um, and that's something that we need to be able to identify. Um, the difference between them, when we look at a norm referenced assessment tool, it's going to be a standardized assessment tool, okay? A standardized assessment tool is a standardized assessment tool are assessment tools that have specific procedures for administering and scoring. So a standardized assessment tool has specific procedures for administering and scoring. And that's because um, when we use standardized assessments, we're comparing our child or our patient with a norm or an average of that population, okay? And I'll, I'll get into this and hopefully make this more clear when we see our when we see our normal distribution in our bell curve. But when we're giving norm referenced assessments, what, what's happening is the makers of these assessment tools, the authors of these assessment tools, um, they pick a, a sample, they pick people, and they, they give their assessment tool on these people. Um, and they say, okay, so I'm the author of the Peabody, and I chose 5,000 kids, and I administered it to 5,000 kids. Um, they had differing socioeconomic status. They had different ethnic backgrounds um, that represent the United States. Um, therefore, you should be able to compare the results of your child um, to these children that we picked here, okay? Um, so that's our job when we do norm referenced assessments is to compare our results with the results that the authors of the Peabody came up with, okay? Um, now we follow uniform procedures for administering and scoring because again, since we're comparing our results to their results, we want to make sure that we're giving the same instructions that they got. Because if we give more instruction, then our kids are going to score better than them, right? And we don't, we don't want that. We want to be able to accurately compare our results with their results. Um, so items in norm reference tests may not have functional significance, but they may be indicators of a child's ability in a level in a domain. Okay, what that means is on a norm referenced assessment, they may have you pick up beans um, and see how many beans you can pick up in 10 seconds. What is the functional significance in that? Okay, not 
very functional, right? But it may indicate a child's ability in fine motor. It may indicate a child's ability to use a pincer grasp, okay, which is important. Now, typically, we do not use or develop goals or intervention plans um, from the specific items that are on these tasks because, again, there's not functional significance. So, on some of these tests, and you're picking, you're picking up so many beans in 10 seconds, um, as an OT, I'm saying that that's not functional, so my goal isn't going to be to pick up 10 beans in 10 seconds. Okay, my goal might be to utilize pincer grasp to button buttons. Um, my goal may be to utilize a three-point pinch or dynamic tripod grasp on a pencil, um, but it wouldn't be to pick up 10 beans in 10 seconds um, directly from that assessment. The other reason why we don't want to do that is because we, we want to get an accurate ability level in, say, fine motor skills, okay? We don't want to teach, if we teach the child how to pick up 10 beans in 10 seconds, and we do that over and over and over again, does that mean that they're functionally going to be able to button buttons or maintain a grasp, sustain a grasp on a pencil, or put marker caps back on the markers, or um, finger feed with Cheerios? Um, no, it, it may not. But all of those areas still make up the domain of, of fine motor skills, right? Um, so as an OT, when I use a norm referenced assessment, um, I need to cognitively think, okay, what does this simulate? What does picking up 10 beans simulate? How can I justify this as function? Okay. Um, so that's why it's not intended to use or develop goals or intervention plans. Now it says typically. I just kind of told you how I use activity analysis of fine motor and response speed um, to identify that picking up 10 buttons or 10, um, 10 beans in 10 seconds um, kind of crosses over and, and uses that fine motor skills for that child in order to use a tripod grasp, in order to pick up Cheerios, in order to pinch buttons through buttonholes, that sort of thing, okay? Um, so those would be my goals. The primary purpose for standardization is to establish reliability and validity um, as high a level as possible. So when we're looking at reliability and validity, and we go over this much, much in detail <clears throat> later on, but I want to make sure that what I'm testing is reliable. I want to make sure that what I'm testing is valid. Okay, I want to be sure that if I'm doing, um, if I'm trying to test for fine motor skills, I want to be sure that I'm really testing fine motor skills, that it's reliable. And I want to make sure that I'm doing it in a way um, that's valid as well, that um, really truly looks at fine motor skills. Um, typically with norm referenced assessments, um, we see scores like standard deviation, standard scores, Z scores, scaled scores, T scores, percentile ranks, um, because again, those standard deviations, the standard scores, scaled scores, T scores, Z scores, percentile ranks, that tells us, those scores tell us how our child or how our patient scored in relation to that normative data, okay? In relation to how the author of the Peabody sample scored, okay? Our child scored two standard deviations below the mean compared to the normative data for that assessment tool, okay? Um, again, we'll go over that a little bit more here. Um, criterion reference tests compare the child's performance to a particular criteria or a defined list of skills. Um, I think of the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory um, it's a checklist where the parent marks capable or unable um, or uncapable of specific self-care skills like shoe tying, 
carrying carrying liquid, pouring liquid, um, cutting with a knife and fork, using a spoon, getting on and off a chair, toileting. Um, so it looks at the, the criterion of self-care skills. It also looks at the criterion of gross motor skills and social interaction. Um, but it looks specifically at at those skills and if the child's capable of those skills or they've achieved mastery with those skills. Um, I also like something like that because I can circle those specific areas that I know that child should be able to do developmentally, but they're not. And they're very specific and they're very functional. So I can use that for my intervention plan, for my goals. I can use those skills for my intervention, which is why I do like criterion referenced assessments. Okay, um, Procedures may or may not be standardized, meaning they may not have um, a specific way of administering them, Okay, um, but that's okay because it still gives us some really good information. Now some criterion reference tests, like the PD, um, the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory is also norm referenced. So what that means is a criterion reference test like the PD um, has these specific performance skills or particular criterion like self-care, um, like, mo like um, mobility, like social interaction, um, and it compares how that child does, how our patient does, we can compare that um, to the author sample, okay, the makers of the PD. We can compare that and see where they're at in relationship to their peers. Um, informal assessments include non-standardized assessments. They include observations. Maybe we're observing in a setting, certain setting like at mealtime or at daycare or at home. Um, we'd be looking for maybe different types of behavior maybe quality of movement, maybe frequency or duration of certain behaviors um, or movements. Um, we'd be doing some interviewing. Maybe we want a, um, an outline of data to collect. So um, maybe we just have kind of a general outline of information that we want. Um, maybe it's birth history. Maybe it's just general history, um, health history of this child. Um, or maybe we have a questionnaire where we want to ask open-ended questions. We can get a lot of rich data from parents and what parents want out of therapy by asking open-ended questions. Again, you get really good information. Just because they're non-standardized doesn't mean that it's not good information and that it's not necessary. So how do we know what test to use? Um, we need to look at the specific purpose and the areas measured by the test. Okay, so I wouldn't want to go to the sensory profile if I want to measure fine motor skills. Okay, um, we need to look at whether the tool was designed for our clients' ages and abilities. So there's some assessment tools that are out there that just focus on children who've experienced autism or children who have autism. Okay, well, I wouldn't want to give that assessment tool to somebody with Down syndrome. It wouldn't be appropriate. Um, also, I wouldn't want to give the sensory profile caregiver questionnaire um, to somebody who's 20. Okay, I'd probably want to um, do the um, do the um, other questionnaire. Okay, where they fill out their own questionnaire. I wouldn't want to necessarily go um, to the caregiver um, because that age isn't that the age gets cut off at um, 10 years. So if the child's older than that, um, I wouldn't want to use that assessment tool. We'd have to look at the specific age. Um, psychometric properties, again, I, we want to look at validity and reliability and that normative data. And I'm going to get into this in, in much more detail um, later on. <clears throat> but I hope that after, after this lecture, we really look at that validity and reliability and how accurate is that normative data that we're, that we're comparing our patient with to. Um, we also need to look at pragmatics or the length of time an assessment takes. Remember, we can bill one evaluation a year. So if we have an assessment that takes five hours, what are we going to bill um, the other four sessions of our time? Okay, that 
something that we we kind of have to to wonder about and that kind of goes into our our cost um so if we're only going to get reimbursed um say a hundred dollars but we're eating up five hours of our time that doesn't pay for our time to do that assessment right um let alone our, our scoring and our ter interpretation of it um you need to look at your competency in administering the assessment as well um, you need to look at the space that's required also. So some of the assessments have you run so many feet down and so many feet back. You have to make sure that you have the space available in order to do that. Um, we also talk about age equivalent scores and, and we've talked about them in the past, how we need to use caution with them. Um, I often would report them um, to insurance companies. Um, but a lot of times when I go over scores with parents, I would just say, you know, yes, they're going to qualify for services um, or I'm going to submit it to insurance and see if they um, will approve um, services at this point. Um, but this is what we can do to help. So instead of focusing on exactly how far delayed they are um, with like an age equivalent score, I would say, yes, they're delayed to where they're going to need services. But this is what we can do to help. And then I would get them on board with my treatment plan. Or, um, you know, I would point out some of the things that, that they were having concerns with. And I would specifically tell them um, what I could do to help. Um, and most times they, they really, really appreciated that and liked that. Um, going over to correlation. <clears throat> When we talk about correlation, we're talking about the relationship between two variables. Um, so two variables um, you're looking at, <clears throat> and one variable, if the score is high, one variable may predict um, a future performance, okay? So if we look at the two variables of height and weight, okay? Um, that has a very high correlation because you know you look at how high a six month old is you look at how high a one year old is you look at how high a five year old is they get taller over time they also get heavy, heavier over time okay so when we look at correlation um, we have two variables height and weight um, as height goes up weight goes up Okay, so if somebody is, um, let's see here. So if we're looking at children six months to one year to five years, and now we go to somebody who's 10 years, can you guess that their weight and height are going to be a little bit taller or taller? They should be quite a bit taller and, and heavier by then, hopefully. Okay, so um, looking at that as a correlation, um, you could predict that somebody who's age 12, chances are, um, <clears throat> they're going to be heavier and taller than somebody who is five years old. So when we look at the correlation coefficient, the coefficient is just the number, okay? The <clears throat> coefficient is just the um, statistical test that was ran, um, which tells us how strong the correlation is. It ranges from negative one to one. So if there's a zero, that means that no relationship exists at all. So if we are giving, um, if we did a correlation on the Peabody, um, and we're looking at fine motor and gross motor domains, if fine motor increases, does gross motor increase automatically? Okay, or if gross motor goes up automatically, or as gross motor increases, does fine motor go down automatically? Okay. Um, probably not. So the correlation between gross motor and fine motor um, may be closer to zero, okay, because there may not be much of a relationship that exists between the two. Now, when we get the negative one, that means there's a negative correlation. A positive one indicates that there's a positive relationship, okay? <clears throat> so a positive relationship is, again, as weight or as height increases, weight increases so they both increase okay as height increases weight increases and so that would be a positive correlation a negative correlation would be if one variable goes up the other one automatically goes down 
okay, as um, as the length of time somebody exercises increases, um, the lower their weight gets. Okay, so as people increase their, their length of time exercising, maybe their weight's going to get lower and lower. Okay, so that would be a, a, an example of maybe some kind of a negative um, correlation. Um, we're going to talk about reliability and validity um, in, in much more detail. Um, and that standard error of measurement we'll talk about too. Um, the standard error of measurement is a score that we get. Um, say our standard error of, error of measurement is a score of 5. Um, and it's used to estimate the range of error. So when we talk about reliability and validity, some things that may impact a child's um, assessment scores, like maybe they're not feeling very well, okay? That standard error of measurement score of 5 um, gives us kind of a plus or minus 5 to our standard score. So say our standard score is 30, our standard error of measurement score is 5. So we would add 5 and minus 5 from our standard score. So that would give us 25 to 35. So it gives us a range of scores then, that range of error. So even though if this child wasn't feeling well one day, chances are he's going to score within that range, even if he's not feeling well. Okay, so that kind of um, takes the place of that takes the place of that S, um, that error, okay? Um, so that kind of helps us with our reliability and our validity. And again, I, I talk a little bit more about that a little later on here. Um, again, here's our normal distribution. And what I just would like to also point out is <clears throat> um, the T-scores here. Now, T-scores are just as a way that scores are converted. Standard scores can be converted into T-scores. And what that does is that tells us, again, um, kind of how they are in relationship to um, the standard deviation. Okay, so they automatically put 50 at the mean, and each one is 10 increments. So it goes 50 to 60, 70, 80, and 40, 30, 20. So all that is, that helps us determine um, where that child's at in relationship to the mean. Okay, it's just another way to measure from the mean. Um, now the PDMS is the Peabody Developmental Motor Scales. A lot, a lot, a lot of standardized assessments automatically plot their standard scores. Um, so the mean here, they convert into 100, which is the 50th percentile, okay? they automatically have a standard score of 100. So if you're looking at the Peabody, if you're looking at um, an IQ test, you get an IQ test of 100. That means you are in the 50th percentile rank, meaning that you scored as well as 50% um, of those that you were compared with, right? So, <clears throat> um, the, the standard scores for the PDMS and for many of the assessment tools um, has 15 um, point intervals. So if you take minus 15 from 100, you get 85 here. That's automatically one standard deviation below the mean. That's automatically negative one Z score, okay? Um, you minus 30 from 100, that's two standard deviations below the mean and a negative two z-score. And you keep minusing 15, and that's three standard deviations below the mean, which is a negative three z-score, okay? So again, a lot of our standardized assessments, you will see 100 is the mean. Um, and that will tell you that 15 intervals away from 100 tells us our standard deviation. 85 is negative 1. 115 is positive 1, meaning it's one standard deviation above the mean. Okay, they did that to kind of simplify life for us. So I think that's kind of cool. When we look at reliability, we're looking at how consistent or stable our scores are 
um, when we test on two different occasions. Okay, so <clears throat> we're looking at how consistency or how consistent are we in scoring um, or how consistent are we with with testing. Um, <clears throat> Reliability should be greater or equal to 0.7. Okay, 0.7 um, is is a really strong um, reliability coefficient. Okay, so when you're looking at different ways of reliability that your assessment tool does, if it gives you a number, not everybody is going to get get a number, but if you get a number of 0.7 or higher, that means that the reliability is pretty good. It's pretty strong. Anything higher than 0.7, all the way up to 1, I mean, 1 is ultimate, but <clears throat> you'll probably never see 1. Um, but 0.9 is very, very, very strong. 0.8 is really good. 0.7 is really, really good, too. Um, some of you will see some that are less than 0.7, but they're close to 0.7, and, and that's okay. Um, <clears throat> but I just want you to know that the higher that is, the higher that that is, or if at least it's 0.7, it's a strong reliability. Um, meth some very common methods of determining reliability are going to include um, t test, retest reliability. This is where you give a client a test or give a person a test, and after a certain length of time, you give the test again, and they should receive a similar score. Okay? Um, the inner rater reliability, you have two independent raters. So you have you as an OT student and your OT educator. At the same time, you are assessing somebody, okay, and you're getting the same scores. If you get the same scores, that means it's going to be a high inner rater reliability, which is good. Um, now, this is where that standard error of measurement comes back in again, because it can really help us on our reliability and our validity. Because if our reliability, if our inner rater reliability is poor, um, or our test retest reliability is, is poor, um, the standard error of measurement kind of gives us that range, right? So it's that plus or minus 5 or plus or minus 3. So if our standard error of measurement score is 3 and our score is, is 75, okay, chances are if we were to do a test retest and it was soon, um, they should score between 72 and 78 again. Um, so it's giving us a little wiggle room, a little error room, um, for unforeseen circumstances, like maybe the child's not feeling well, or maybe, um, you know, they weren't used to you, or maybe they didn't hear you. Um, the inner rater reliability, again, is the two independent raters getting the same scores um, at the same time. So if you and your fieldwork educator are scoring somebody, you, you get a standard score of 72, and your fieldwork educator gets a standard score of 78, Hey, that's great. You're still within that standard error of measurement score, okay? Um, so that's why that kind of helps us with our, our reliability. When we look at validity, we look at the correlations of the test and the correlation between the criterion of our test. Now, the criterion being fine motor skills, gross motor skills, um, sensory um, processing, um, Let's see here, visual motor skills, gross motor skills, fine motor skills, some of those types of, of areas that we're looking at, okay? Also called domains, criterion, okay, same thing. Self-care skills. Um, so if validity, anywhere from 0.4 to 0.8 is kind of the range, um, 0.7, again, that magical 0.7, or greater indicates performance on one test has some predictability on the other test. Okay, so 0.7 or higher indicates that there's some predictability. Um, I would wonder on the Peabody what the validity coefficient is between um, <clears throat> fine motor and visual motor. Okay, because hand-eye coordination and hand movement and hand coordination with fine motor skills, um, I would wonder if there's some sort of correlation. If somebody's fine motor skills are high, I wonder what that correlation is um, with visual motor skills, okay? The different types of validity, and not everybody's assessment tool is going to address validity. Um, some of you may only have one type of validity. Some of you may not have any. Some of you may have a few of them. 
but just to kind of give some differences between the types of validity, um, face validity is the extent to what it actually measures. So does it actually measure sensory processing? Does it actually measure what it says it's measuring? Does it actually measure fine motor skills or gross motor skills? Um, content validity, you're looking specifically at the content um, within the assessment tool. So do the items accurately sample the domain? So if we're looking at fine motor, okay, on the Peabody, they have you do buttons, they have you do beading, they have you stack blocks, they have you do a puzzle, they have you do um, turning pages of a book. So do all of those things accurately sample fine motor skills? Okay, criterion validity um, helps you predict performance in other measures. So does fine motor skills predict the performance in visual motor skills? Okay, um, does gross motor skills predict the ability on um, running and mobility? You know, I, I don't know. Um, construct validity measures a theoretical construct. How does it measure self-care, ADL? How does it measure fine motor, visual motor? Okay, how does it actually measure those constructs of, of gross motor, fine motor, visual motor, sensory processing? Okay. Um, threats to validity and reliability include, again, so why wouldn't a test be valid or why wouldn't results be reliable? Um, if a child's sick, they're not feeling well. If they're fatigued, okay? Um, if they're unfamiliar with the examiner or the test environment, um, those would be all things that, that may impact a child's test scores. Um, the length of the test. So if a test takes you five hours, um, you know, how is that child going to be performing at that fifth hour? Um, tone differences may affect speed and accuracy of of the child's performance. When I say tone differences, I'm talking about voice tone. So what happens when I talk really, really slow and monotone? Versus if I talk really, really, really fast and you guys are trying to take notes and I'm thinking, okay, well, we gotta talk about illness, fatigue, unfamiliar with bias and, and length of test and blah, 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 and tone differences and this may affect your speed and accuracy. You know, I mean, you you start to feel maybe anxious, and, and children are going to feel that too, especially when you're giving them some sort of an assessment or test. Um, the other thing is cultural bias. So we talked about in Guatemala how the parents carry the children on their back or carry the children with them. So on the Peabody, where we're looking at mobility um, and walking and crawling and some of those types of things, if we take the Peabody down to Guatemala, and again, remember, our whole point is to compare our patient to the makers of the Peabody sampling, right? Um, so if we look at the Peabody sampling, chances are they're not going to have children from Guatemala in their sampling, right? And so when I look at that assessment tool and I need to look at the population that they sampled from, is it culturally appropriate for me to test the kids in Guatemala with the Peabody, which was was the the comparative data was set up on a middle class Caucasian um, children ages, um, you know, six months to six years. OK, probably not. So that's why you really need to look at these assessment tools and to determine if it's important or not. I know the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory looks at, um, they specifically say in there that socioeconomic status was not factored when identifying the population um, for, this for this assessment. So as a therapist, I need to determine, okay, does that matter so much? Well, for me, working with, I worked with a lot of middle class to lower class socioeconomic status. Um, I didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal. So I continue to use that assessment. Um, but those are some things that you that I want you to start thinking of, okay? And, and looking and analyzing these assessments this way. Because it could affect your validity and reliability depending on what it is and what you're using it for.
So what can we do to become competent testers? We need to study the test manual. You have got to spend time with the test manual, okay? Um, that's why this lab for this assess or this lab, you will have to work with your own assessment in your group and try and find what kind of methods did they use for reliability validity. Is it norm reference? Is it criterion reference? Is it standardized? Is it non-standardized? Okay, I want you to really be able to pick that apart. Um, another good way to become a competent tense, um, tester is to observe the test being administered by a competent ex examiner and discuss the results. For you to practice the test administration, you can practice on a peer, you can practice on a sibling, you can practice on um, somebody's child. Okay. Um, another really good way, and this goes back up to observing the test being administered and competent by a competent examiner, when you're on field work or maybe if you're doing inter um, volunteer work, you get a copy of the assessment tool form and your field work educator is is scoring the assessment or, or giving the assessment. You sit in the corner quietly and you try and score it also and then you, you visit about it and you ask, um, you see if you, you fall in that um, same range. I um, mean you talk about why did you score it a certain way? Why did your educator score it a certain way? And that kind of goes with consult with experienced examiner about your interpretation. So um, is what you scored um, something that they would have scored also? Okay. Um, you need to prepare the administration and scoring cue sheets. Um, I can tell you I think there was, when I first started, I forgot to fill in the name um, and date um, of, a, of a, an assessment that I gave. Um, and we had a filing system and lo and behold, the assessment tool fell out um, and landed in somebody else's chart for whatever reason. And so I had a really hard time finding it. I mean, I eventually did find it and I went back and, and found the date, but it would have been so much easier comparing um, a re-evaluation data to our regular evaluation, right, data, um, <clears throat> and comparing and contrasting um, and looking at progress. But instead, I had to try and track it down in somebody else's chart. I had to um, look in the scheduling book and see what date I actually did the, did the assessment and stuff like that. So it's really helpful. Um, and take my word for it, to prepare those scoring cue sheets. Okay, it's very, very important. Um, and to prepare the testing environment. So if you have a little child um, who has autism and you're getting the order for um, aggressive behaviors, um, you know, you're going to want to get some of the stuff out of your testing room and make sure that it's safe and appropriate for them. Um, again, you're going to administer the test items. Um, so you're going to stay on track. Um, I already talked about the consulting with an experienced examiner. And it doesn't have to be on field work. When you're a practitioner, consult with some of your coworkers. Consult with people that you know. Consult with one another that, you, that you're meeting now. Um, and periodically recheck iterator reliability. Have another therapist sit in with you um, and both score a test and see where you're at. See if, if you get that iterator reliability. Um, some things that we consider ethical when we are testing and when we are giving assessments is making sure that we're competent. We need to be competent when we're giving these assessment tools. Again, the whole point is we're trying to get our children services, right? We're, we're, or we're trying to make sure that they're qualifying for services. So, I mean, it would be fraud if we falsified information, but um, since we're comparing our results of these assessments... Um, to the author's sampling, right, which we call that the normative sample, um, and we're comparing that, we want to make sure that we're giving our children the same cues. We want to make sure that we're following the same directions um, that our sample did, right? Um, because if we give more cues, more feedback, um, and our children score higher, um, then it's not truly, it's not really truly comparing. It's not truly 
um, their performance. Okay, we can't really compare um, what we're doing to another, or we can't really compare our results to those results accurately. On that note, something else I, I really want you guys to um, to realize is if you do deviate from the instructions of a standardized assessment, um, you need to you need to report that. And again, this is so important. I, I want you guys to write this down. This is so so important. If you deviate from the instructions of a standardized assessment, you need to document it. Um, because if you're giving additional cues, we can't really use that normative data because we can't compare how our child did since we gave them different cues. So if we're using our assessment to qualify them for services and they scored two standard deviations below the mean, so typically they would qualify for services that low, and we gave them less cues or we gave them more cues, um, that would get thrown out. Okay, that, that wouldn't count. Um, that child wouldn't get services because um, we gave them additional cues. Now, on the flip side to that, when, and when I worked in outpatient, um, I would do early intervention um, consultations and sometimes evaluations. And... Um, sometimes with the Peabody, it doesn't give you, it's still a standardized assessment, but it doesn't give you really specific directions because you're working with children under age one, right? And, and they can't really understand and comprehend um, a lot of these questions. And so the early interventionist um, would say, well, I think you didn't follow standardized protocols, so we can't use this assessment um, for them to qualify for services. And so it was kind of like a... Uh, kind of like a slap in the face, you know, um, but kind of a realization that um, how important it is to follow these instructions. Now, in an outpatient setting and in my outpatient setting, there were times when I did give additional cues or when the parent would jump in and give additional cues and I really couldn't say anything. And I would simply put that in my assessment right up and say, the parent stepped in here and gave additional verbal visual cues. Therefore, um, the comparison to the normative data needs to be read with caution. Okay, so again, I said something like um, additional verbal cues and visual or verbal cues and visual cues were given from the parent. Therefore, um, the comparison um, of the standardized assessment or the comparison to the normative sample needs to be read with caution, something something along those lines. Um, because again, what we're comparing, if my child got extra cues that those children didn't get, I have to really be careful. Now, what I still could use that assessment for is measuring progress and jotting down that this child had verbal visual cues on this particular item of the assessment, and then the next time I gave it, like maybe six months later, when everything's due for insurance and stuff, I could say whether or not they made progress, okay? Um, so you still can use it in certain settings, but some settings are really, 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 really strict on, um, on following that standardized protocol, and you need to be competent in that. You need to be competent in that. Um, maintaining subject privacy is very important. We all know about HIPAA. Um, communicating the test results are also appropriate or also really important and ethical. Um, how we're reporting them to parents, how we're reporting them to doctors, how we're reporting them to insurance companies, to one another, to, to other therapists. Um, and again, using that cultural competence. Um, certain assessment tools like the sensory profile, you can now get that in Spanish. Um, do you need an interpreter? Um, if you do get an interpreter, how much is lost in that interpretation? Is it still valid? Is it still reliable? Okay, so it's just some things um, to keep in mind with language. And then is it a bias of the test? Like the Peabody or the, the PD saying that they only worked with or they didn't check the, the um, socioeconomic status of their, their um, normative sample. Um, so is that a really big bias of the assessment? Um, or what that sample is, if they only looked at um, 
lower socioeconomic status or higher socioeconomic status or African Americans or Native Americans or Caucasian or um, you know if they only looked at a certain amount of, of the population is that is that a bias is that important if your client that you're testing is Native American is African American is Caucasian is um, any other um, ethnicity or culture for that matter um, so just under 60 minutes, that is all I have.